Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on learning and memory. In this video, what we're going to talk about is uh, Pavlovian, which is also known as classical conditioning. So the title is Pavlovian slash classical conditioning. So, uh, the structure for this video then, I'm going to start off by uh, discussing Pavlov's famous experiments with dogs, because I think uh, it's simplest to see Pavlovian conditioning uh, with Pavlov's original experiments. I think Pavlov's original experiments are pretty much as simple as you can get uh, with understanding Pavlovian conditioning. Okay, I'm just going to firstly uh, show you Pavlov's experiments in uh, normal everyday language and then what we'll do is we'll talk about some of the fancy language that you can use uh, when explaining Pavlovian conditioning. So we'll add in a bit of the fancy nomenclature associated with Pavlovian conditioning. Okay, and uh, then what we're going to talk about is an example uh, where we can actually see the neural correlate of uh, Pavlovian conditioning. So we can actually see on uh, a neural basis, by looking at neural circuitry, how Pavlovian conditioning occurs. And the example that we're going to see this in is a Californian sea slug known as Aplysia californica. So I will introduce Aplysia californica to you. Then what we'll discuss firstly is the gill withdrawal reflex in Aplysia californica. Then what we'll discuss is sensitization of the gill withdrawal reflex in uh, Aplysia uh, californica. And then finally what we'll do is look at the Pavlovian conditioning uh, within Aplysia californica's uh, gill withdrawal reflex. But it is essential to look at the sensitization firstly, because when you actually see the Pavlovian conditioning in the Aplysia uh, sea slugs um, gill withdrawal reflex, you might think, wait a second, isn't this just sensitization? Uh, but there is a subtle difference between the two, and I want that to be uh, uh, obvious. Okay, right. Uh, so. Uh, let's start off then by discussing the common sense Pavlovian conditioning, which are the experiments that Ivan Pavlov did. Okay, so uh, Pavlovian conditioning is named after the Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov. Okay, and basically this is what he did. He took an untrained dog. Okay, so here we have our untrained uh, dog. Okay, so here is our untrained dog. Okay, and basically, if you take any old dog off the streets, what you can do is you can show it a piece of meat. Okay, so here we have our piece of meat, so I'll colour that in in red. Okay, and basically, the dog's response to seeing the piece of meat will be that it starts to salivate. Okay, and salivate is the uh, nice word for drool. And if you have a big dog, if you have a pet, dog that's a big dog, this will be all too familiar to you. If it's a house dog, basically, uh, then you can sit around at your kitchen table having a meal, and basically your dog will be standing there drooling, basically, uh, at the sight of the food. It doesn't actually need to eat any of the food. Of course, the dog knows that it never ever gets to eat any of the food on the table, but it will still drool just at the sight of the uh, food. Small dogs, I have three dogs. I have three pet dogs. One of them is very, very large, and it does this. Okay, it's a Weimarana. And uh, the other two are much smaller, and they don't do it. Um, they're more lap dogs, and they don't do it. So it's big dogs, I think, that generally do this. Right. But anyway, if you show uh, a dog uh, a piece of meat, then it will drool. And the fancy word for drool is that it will salivate. So the response is salivation. Okay, right. Uh, so, basically, if you take an untrained dog off the street, so this same dog that we haven't done any training for uh, yet, okay, so we take the same dog here, and we ring a bell, okay, so here is a bell, and we ring this bell at the dog, then the dog will not salivate, okay? Uh, so, these two different stimuli will produce different responses. The meat will produce the response of salivation. The bell will not produce the response of salivation. Okay, so this is what Pavlov then did. Basically, he then decided, I'm going to start a training regime for this dog. 
okay? And training is the common sense name for conditioning, okay? So conditioning is the fancy name for what we're about to do. Okay, so basically what you do is uh, you take this dog and if what you'll do is you'll ring the bell and then just after ringing the bell you will present the dog with the meat, okay? And then the dog will salivate, okay? So what we do is we take this dog and just before giving it the um, meat to salivate over, uh, what we will do is we'll ring the bell first. So firstly we ring the bell and then let's say a few seconds later uh, what follows is it's presented the meat, okay? And then, of course, the response to the meat will be to salivate. Okay, so this is our experiment. We do this, and then uh, we do it multiple times. So we might wait a few hours and then repeat this again. So we'll ring a bell for the dog, and then we'll present it with a piece of meat, and it will salivate. And we'll repeat it many, many times. And then basically what happens is that... Uh, you can now take this dog that has undergone this training regime and you can now just ring the bell, okay? So you'll just ring the bell this time. You won't present it the meat afterwards, okay? So you just ring the bell and basically the dog will salivate, okay? So you can get the dog to salivate when you just ring a bell. You can get the dog to salivate to the sound of the bell. Okay, and that is Pavlovian conditioning, that I can basically take this stimulus uh, that should be unimportant, it should not cause salivation, and by pairing this stimulus with another stimulus which does produce salivation, I can make the dog salivate in response to this first stimulus. Okay, right, so that's called Pavlovian or classical conditioning, that you can get the dog to associate these two stimuli and then it can produce the response that it would produce to the first stimulus to the second stimulus, which wouldn't usually produce that response in an untrained dog. Okay, right, so now let's put in some fancy nomenclature because obviously it doesn't need to be bells and meat and salivation that this works for. It can work for loads of different things. So we now want to get some fancy nomenclature that allows us to generalize, okay? And we can use this nomenclature in the more general setting, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so, fancy nomenclature then. So, firstly, the meat, okay, this first stimulus, is what's known as the unconditioned stimulus, okay? So, why is it called that? Well, it's obvious why it's called a stimulus. It's a sensory stimulus that we are presenting to the dog. Unconditioned, basically that means untrained. We haven't needed to train the dog to react to this stimulus. It produces the response of salivation to this uh, stimulus, this unconditioned stimulus, before you've ever done training, okay? So this is the unconditioned stimulus, the stimulus that didn't require any training to get the dog's response, okay? And the response of salivation, this is known as the unconditioned response. Well, specifically, the response of salivation to the unconditioned stimulus. So when the dog salivates, uh, because of being presented the unconditioned stimulus, that's called the unconditioned response. Okay, so we present the unconditioned stimulus and we get the unconditioned response. Okay, so basically this is what you can do in any unconditioned animal, untrained animal. Okay, right. Now, the bell, this second stimulus, is what's known as the conditional stimulus. Okay, so this is a stimulus that is only going to produce the response of salivation if we have trained the dog. Okay, so it's conditional. It requires training. Okay, right. And then after you have trained the dog, after the dog has been through this rigorous Pavlovian uh, conditioning, uh, then basically when you provoke the dog with the conditional stimulus. So when you ring the bell for the dog, you um, present the dog with the conditional stimulus, the dog will salivate, and when it salivates to the conditional stimulus, that is then called uh, the conditioned response. So the response which uh, required training, basically, the response which only occurs because uh, you have trained the dog. Okay, now people often, confusingly, usually abbreviate these. So, unconditioned stimulus is usually abbreviated to US. 
Unconditioned response is usually abbreviated to UR. Conditional stimulus is usually abbreviated to CS. And conditioned response is usually abbreviated to CR. So, putting, uh, stating Pavlovian conditioning just in terms of this nomenclature now, basically, you start off with some individual, so we'll generalize it further, we'll call the dog an individual, so it doesn't have to be in dogs, many uh, individuals can show Pavlovian conditioning. Okay, so you get an individual. The individual, when presented with an unconditional, sorry, an unconditioned stimulus, uh, will produce the unconditioned response. Okay, but when you initially present this unconditioned individual with the conditional stimulus, they will not produce a response. Okay, what you then do is you pair the conditional stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. Okay, so you associate the two. Usually, the conditional stimulus will be done a few moments before the unconditioned stimulus is delivered. Okay, you can deliver them together. What you must make sure of is that you don't deliver the conditional stimulus, let's say, an hour in advance of the unconditioned stimulus. That won't work. It won't work if you ring the bell an hour before presenting the dog with the meat. It needs to be a few seconds, basically, or not at least not too long before. Okay. So, you pair the conditional stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. You repeat this many, many times. So you present the conditional stimulus and then present the unconditioned stimulus. And of course, the unconditioned stimulus then produces the unconditioned response. And then sooner or later, basically, you'll be able to present the dog with the conditional stimulus on its own without the unconditioned stimulus, and you will get the response anyway. And when that occurs, that response is now called the conditioned response. Okay, right, so that is Pavlovian conditioning, or classical conditioning. It's starting to gradually be renamed classical conditioning, okay? Uh, most textbooks now will call it classical conditioning rather than Pavlovian conditioning, but some people will still refer to it as Pavlovian conditioning. Okay, I just learnt it as Pavlovian conditioning when I was like 15 doing GCSEs. Uh, so that's the one that has stuck in my head over classical conditioning. But then when you actually read uh, degree level textbooks, they use classical conditioning rather than uh, Pavlovian conditioning. Okay, right. Uh, so uh, let's now talk about... Uh, we're going to go beyond this. This is the common sense Pavlovian conditioning. We're now going to talk about a species where we can actually see the neural correlate of this. Okay, so you see the problem with working with dogs is that their nervous systems are horrendously complicated. Okay, you have no hope of being able to find the neural correlate of this. You have no hope of being actually able to tr translate this response into uh, neuron by neuron diagrams, basically. You can't say this is occurring because this neuron, this neuron, this neuron, this neuron. You have no hope, basically. Maybe one day we'll be able to do that, but at the moment we can't do that. So, we need to go and look for this sort of a response in a much simpler organism where the nervous system is much, much simpler. And basically, uh, one of neuroscience, one of the favourite creatures to study neuroscience in is something called Aplysia californica. So neuroscientists absolutely love these things, okay? And basically, they are enormous great slugs that live in the sea of California. So they're called, also called the Californian sea slug sometimes called the Californian sea hare because actually the size of them is more like a hare basically than a slug. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, let me draw you a little picture of Aplysia californica. Okay, so basically it is a slug, so I'll draw it as a slug, like so. So here are its little oral tentacles, then it's got these extra little protrusions at the front called the rhinophores. Okay, then it's got this sort of expansion at the back here, like so. Okay, and then it's got its tail. Okay, right, so it's got an expansion in the middle here. Right, okay, so uh, this is what the Aplysia californica looks like. And basically, these things are absolutely enormous. Uh, they can 
I think the biggest one, according to Wikipedia, was around 70 inches long. Okay, so that's big. <laughs> okay, um, but usually I think they're around 5 inches long, and they usually weigh around uh, 7 kilograms. Okay, right. So they are big, big things. Now, why is a plesia californica so appealing to neuroscientists? Well, basically the human brain has a hundred billion neurons. Okay, so a hundred billion, like so. Uh, and each one of these neurons can have connections to up to around 10,000 other neurons. The complexity is out of control. It's incomprehensible, okay? Um, whether we will ever get to the point of fully understanding the human brain, I don't know. It's just uncomprehensible, basically, at the moment. So, what neuroscientists did is they turned to looking at much, much simpler organisms, organisms that have much, much more simple neuro nervous systems. Okay, maybe not simpler organisms, but uh, simpler nervous system at least. Okay, um, because potentially we could actually completely understand the nervous system of one of these simpler organisms. Okay, so basically. Aplysia californica has around 20,000 neurons, so that's on a more comprehensible level. And also what's absolutely lovely about Aplysia californica is that these neurons are all enormous, okay? So they're big, big cells, okay? And that means that it's very easy to do electrophysiological analysis on the neurons of Aplysia californica. So that makes these things absolutely ideal for studying neuroscience on. Okay, right. So, most of what is studied refers to something called the Gill withdrawal reflex. Okay, and you can see all sorts of forms of learning uh, through studying the Gill withdrawal reflex. You can see habituation, you can see sensitization, uh, and you can see Pavlovian conditioning. Okay, right. So, Gill withdrawal reflex then. So I need to tell you firstly what the gill withdrawal reflex is. So to do this, we need to look at the Aplysia californica from a different angle. We need to look at it as though we're looking from above this time. So let me draw you a little picture of what Aplysia californica looks like from above. So here is this uh, large portion in the middle. Okay, here is the tail of the Aplysia californica, and then at the front we have these oral tentacles, and then the rhinophores, like so. So here are the rhinophores, there are the oral tentacles. Okay, right. Now we're going to be interested in this portion here, because basically you have a very special little structure here. Okay, so I'll draw this like this. Okay, and basically this little tube at the end here, is called, and this is sitting right on top of a Aplysia californica, so if you look down at the top of an Aplysia californica, what you see is a little tube sitting on the top of the Aplysia californica, and this little tube is called the siphon, okay? And uh, basically, what you can do, oh, well, I need to actually just show one more little thing here. There's also a sheet of muscle here, okay, like so, a little flap of muscle, and I'll colour this in in red. So here is this little flap of muscle here. And basically this little flap of muscle is called the gill. So basically the gill withdrawal reflex involves squirting water onto the siphon of the Aplysia californica. So if you squirt water onto the siphon of the Aplysia californica, what then happens is the gill retracts basically, it contracts, and then it ends up covering over the siphon. So this is a little flap of muscle. So basically, if you bring in your little pipette here, and you drop water onto this siphon here, what will happen is the gill will um, contract and cover over the siphon to protect it. That is what is known as the gill withdrawal reflex. And basically, we are going to see Pavlovian conditioning within this gill withdrawal reflex. Okay, right, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.